welcome to the lobby. I am not Danny O'Dwyer. I'm Justin Abel. Danny, unfortunately, could not be with us. He is doing some super secret stuff that hopefully you'll hear about more later this week. In the meantime, you have to put up with me and some guys that I have on the couch. I have Mike Mahardy and Ty Root joining me to talk about lots of exciting things. We're going to be talking about some Deus Ex, some Star Wars. But first, we're going to kick it off with some Hearts of the Star. Stone. Hearthstone. Heart, hearts of hearts, Stone. Hearts, hearts, Hearthstone. We're going to talk about the Witcher expansion. Hearths, hearts of Stone. Yes. Do, do you think it was a joke that they called it Hearts of Stone? Do you think they're trying to go with Hearthstone? Or is this is this tied in? So the Hearts of Stone expansion is out now. You've already played it. You you reviewed it for us. Yeah. And Ty, I know you're excited to try it out. Yes. What, why, do you, why is it called Hearts of Stone? Um, there's a few... They, say that specific phrase a few times, but there's a few characters who kind of, I think it's kind of like a character study of Geralt, how he's kind of incapable of loving people, although you can love people in this expansion. <laughs> I loved a lot of people. Yeah. I thought that was the game. whole point of The Witcher is is loving people. Yes, yeah. you love people. <laughs> and I loved a whole house of women once. <laughs> in The Witcher 3. And, and uh, yeah, so Sorry, Mary. one of the villains, there's a kind of a couple of villains, and they are both just... Heartless, I guess that's how it ties in, I would imagine, because one of the person people who says that phrase to Geralt is ends up being kind of a jerk. So, so you get to learn a little bit more about Geralt, and, and it's a very story focused expansion. This is this isn't something that adds a lot of new gameplay elements. Very few. Um, mm -hmm. You do get um, rune crafting, which is just another way to kind of. Uh, affect how you use signs. So Axie now, the one that stuns people or turns them against uh, their allies, you can kind of uh, chain it. If you kill mm -hmm. them in a certain amount of time, it'll chain to the next person. But yeah, those things are all kind of minuscule compared to the story and everything. Um, here you'll see, uh, you know, hopefully spoiler-free gameplay right now, but you do a lot of things that kind of cater to what made The Witcher 3's main game so good. Mm -hmm. It was just each quest had a lot of substance and how they told their stories and these self-contained um, you know, little asides that played into the main story, like quests really well. And the characters are awesome. Um, pretty much everyone you meet. You meet Shani. Here's, uh, that was Olgierd von Everick. This is, uh, there's Shani right here in the scene, as well as uh, Gontaro Dim, who, he's one of the people, you have no idea the whole time what their motivation he is. He doesn't look evil at all. He doesn't, <laughs> most of the time, until he does this to your face, he marks you, because like, you're kind of his mm -hmm. lackey. For there is a, probably a different term I could have used, but yeah. For, so a lot of times you're carrying out quests for him, whether you want to or not. Does it go into Geralt's history about why he likes redheads so much? Mm, I, I don't think curious. so. Not that I remember. He in his workout routine. Yeah, because talks about his like CrossFit training. Yeah, he does. He does CrossFit. He drinks uh, Pro Complex when he's done working out. <laughs> Five well, star. <laughs> so I know Shawnee is one of the characters that you're most interested in learning and, and seeing more, uh, Todd. Yeah, I mean, I, I've always appreciated The Witcher just because of its story. It's, it's weird because I've, I've now hit that stride where I've been playing so much Metal Gear mm -hmm. for so long, for like over 60 hours, where I'm, I'm now really... I now yearn for a good story. I want an actual good story in a game because the, the Metal Gear is is just complete dog shit, <laughs> sorry. But the gameplay is amazing. Yeah, some people might argue with you on that They're one. dumb, they're wrong. <laughs> um, that story's horrible. But regardless, The Witcher has, that's what grabbed me always was the story. And you can see that throughout the entire game, the actual main game, not just even the, um, the DLC, is that they borrow from so much like fairy tales, literature, Certain tropes, obviously, they're gonna like you know touch upon, but it's nothing like. But they always kind of have their own spin on it, you know. Mm -hmm. like, it's always something unique. Um, and their side quests are so good, and mm -hmm. like they're interesting, and the stories behind them are interesting. And yeah, you can approach all these characters different ways. But um, one thing that I've always loved about The Witch and I admired about it is that it does make you care about the people mm -hmm. and the characters. Um, the gameplay is good. It's not like revolutionary, but obviously, it's the story that actually grabs me. And so, I, I it's is, is this a continuation of his story, or is it like before the events of Wild Hunt? It's kind of just during the Wild Hunt. You, okay. it's, it's recommended level thirty, but you pretty much will just get a prompt for uh, to go to this bulletin board in the town, and then okay. you meet someone there that's like, oh, come by Old Geard von Everick's Manor, and he'll get tell you more. And that kind of sets off a few different quest lines that you go through, mm -hmm. with a main one and a few side ones. Because okay. the game is so story focused, it's hard to talk about it, and yeah. I think not spoil things. But you did give the game overall a nine. Yeah, it, it's awesome. it's really good. I mean, it the pacing is r excellent. Um, it's also like Ty had mentioned, it really like The Witcher Three in general plays on like you know fantasy tropes and whatnot. Mm -hmm. This one really pushes that. 
but each of them kind of is very subversive in the way they tell them. You know, there's the prince and the frog, which <laughs> I guarantee you that fairy tale has never been told the way that <laughs> CD Projekt Red does it here. Um, there's this character who's very, very terrifying. It looks like something from uh, like Pan's Labyrinth. I like that you cut away from this right before he reveals his face. It's yeah, like, oh, it's gross. Gone. <laughs> yeah. Um, I see anything. And, but like within the first two yeah. hours, you're fighting three different bosses, like mini bosses, and they're all unique in their own way. But you go to a wedding, and it sounds mm -hmm. boring. And there were a few, um, you know, I kind of had a few complaints with these mini games that you're kind of forced into. But they don't last that long, and they're very minor in the grand scheme of things. But it's just very funny. The wedding mm -hmm. plays out like a sitcom in a fantasy world. Then you do a heist. It feels like <laughs> Grand Theft Auto, if you know, or Ocean's Eleven, if it was in mm -hmm. you know Middle Earth or something. Um, or the Northern Kingdoms, I guess, to be more specific. So yeah. there's a lot of it's kind of a, a lot of different things you can do, kind of coalesce in an awesome way. Yeah, you mentioned in your review that maybe the mini games and the detective sections didn't meld quite as well. Yeah, the detective sections, I always felt like they were forced in the main game. I guess it, it plays into Geralt, like the Witcher's abilities Sense, as a character. Yeah. yeah, but these ones were almost. With like one exception, I think there were eight of them that I went through, and each one was just follow this blood trail to 20 feet away and find this thing that I could have just seen with my eyes as a human without, you know, those cat eyes. There's you a character that, that calls you trail. Puss Peepers, and I assume that's because <laughs> you're cat eyes, but uh, maybe it's just a Northern Kingdom slang for mm -hmm. something meaner. And so this is kind of a precursor to more Witcher content that we're going to be getting in early 2016, the Blood and Wine expansion. And, and that's going to expand the story out even more. This was about 10 hours, I think, and the Blood and Wine expansion is going to continue that by even 20 hours. What kind of additional things do you want to see in the game? Um, i just like to see more of these quests that fit. It was Hearts of Stone fit pretty seamlessly into the main game, mm -hmm. and I'd like to see that continue, but at the same time, I would also would not mind, as, you know, by the time Blood and Wine comes out, you said it was quarter one, or no, Ooh. just first half. First half, for now it's first half of 2016. It used right. to be Q1, no, maybe, we'll maybe a little later. Sometime in 2016, before summer. So with almost a year removed from The Witcher 3's full release, I would not mind seeing them do kind of either a prequel or a you know, continuation of the main story, because I think this, the, during the fall release schedule, this was a good time for someone to say, hey, if you want to pay $10 for a quest that's going to fit into the game, go for it. But later on down the road, we're going to give you something that's going to reward you for having beat the game mm -hmm. or kind of have, knowing these characters, maybe we'll go back to see what was going on before this. I would not mind that at all, and I think that would work. And Ty, for someone who does, I, I think in your job, you don't get to play as, games as often as, no. as a lot of us do. And, but this is something that enjoy them. You, you know, it's really pulled you in. You've, you've played a lot of The Witcher 3. Yeah. What is it that keeps you going along? And do you think that just in more story, is that enough to pull you into? Yeah, I mean, I, I just think it's about taking a break, right? I mean, I think the, the beautiful thing about this expansion and then the next one is that they're, they're timed far apart enough for me mm -hmm. to kind of want to go back into that world and actually see what Geralt's up to now. I mean, and I like to see more. I, I love the politics behind this game. I love that... The, that the story of this game is not so much about what is happening with uh, with like Ciri's dad and the Emperor and, and and Novigrad. It's more about or Roach and and that whole thing and Tamaria. It's more about what Geralt wants, right? But all these political themes and 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 snowballs are kind of like in place, you know, like about to like explode at some point. And so you have all this stuff kind of going on around you, but it's not really. It doesn't mean much to you as your character. You just kind of observe it. I'd like to see what happens now, like depending on what actions happen at the end of your game. Like for example, I'm gonna spoil everything for something now, so you <laughs> just turn this off. You don't want to listen to it. But in my game, Siri takes over as Empress, right? So I would love to see um, what happens after that. Like, mm -hmm. like how is she as an Emperor, you know, or an Empress? Like, does she act, does she rule more fairly than her father? You know, her father killed a bunch of people at the end of my game and kind of piss some people off as she takes over, how does her now political leanings affect the story mm -hmm. and then the world around you, you know? And also, like, there's so many awesome side quests in that game. Like, there, I remember this, there's this one where you have no idea if what you're doing is, like, good or bad, but, like, some lady's like, hey, it's, it's another spoiler. I'm warning you now, turn this off. Uh, he's like, throw this baby in the <laughs> oven. Just fucking trust me, you know? You're like, uh, okay, and you have, like, split seconds to react, right? But those stories are so engaging and they all kind of like come together to like really help something. So, mm -hmm. and like help progress the story, you and your character. And it's just, it's, it's really, really good storytelling. And so I'd love to see more of that. Well, last question, if you're still here and you did not turn off even though Ty kept telling you to turn away. I'm gonna spoil shit. 
What What is the most surprising thing that you can say without spoiling something that you think people are going to be really surprised to, to have seen in the game or that was a really kind of shocking or big moment for you? Um, there was a brief glimpse of it during the gameplay, but I don't think, if you don't know what's going on, it won't make sense. There's a part where you are not in... Well, obviously the whole game you're not in the real world, but you're not in the game's world anymore. You go to this kind of metaphysical dimension, and it was crazy, but it worked so well, and somehow they made it work, and I think that was my favorite part. It was kind of, it was just this alternate universe that was gorgeous, but also kind of scary as shit. It, it was, <laughs> there, the, you saw that guy about to lift his hood, that mm -hmm. part was scary. It's, yeah. Just like fighting him and seeing him is bad. There's all there's a lot of those like weird creepy moments in this game. Like that, that little uh, really what do they call the, the, the botchling? The botchling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Uma. first time I saw that <laughs> was awful. But that's not in the new one, so yeah. But there's You're always fine. like something new like that and weird. Yeah. Oh, I would also love to hear more. Um, I always I, the the elven sage that helps Siri throughout the entire story. Again, spoiler. Okay. You have five seconds to turn this off. <laughs> turn this off. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Uh, that elven sage, apparently, you know, I like to know about his world, where he comes yeah. from. He helped kind of, like, one of the Wild Hunt guys was like a student. It'd be kind of cool to yeah. kind of explore that. Yeah, there's a lot of cool interpersonal ties. Yeah. And that was a surprisingly, uh, a, a talk that we kept on track and did not go into inappropriate things, which I thought might have been Are more happy, likely. Mary? Hearts of Stone is out now. You should go check it out. And as soon as you get the chance to play it, we'd love to hear what you think. How are you enjoying this extension of The Witcher 3? And so, next up, uh, before, we, well, we, before we go on to our next segment, thank you so much, Mike and Ty. We're going to see a trailer for something that was just announced today, a Kickstarter for a Friday the 13th game. Let's check it out. After it happened, I expected someone to do something. I expected parents to show up with questions and concerns. I thought the police would have done more, but nothing happened. Nothing changed. Shh, quiet. Someone will hear us. They opened it again the next year, and they were back to their old habits. <laughs> Troy, did you hear something? Relax, babe. Probably just Steve trying to scare us. They're just kids, right? So was he. He was just an innocent boy. I was a good mother to him. My boy. My sweet, sweet Jason. That's some good timing, Friday the 13th, as a Kickstarter, right as we're going into some Halloween festivities. But next up on the lobby, we're going to be talking about the Star Wars Season Pass announcement. The beta is wrapping up. You have a couple more hours to get into that. But for you, ostensibly, like, there's no more time to play, but we did learn a lot more about the Season Pass. I'm joined on the couch by Mike Mahardy, Rob Handlery, and Aaron. What do you guys think? So having played a lot of time with the beta, that was extended oh, much longer than we thought it was going to be, what are your overall impressions? So nine, they said today nine million people played the beta. Mm -hmm. To me, that says that this was a demo. Um, given, but, yeah, I mean like, the the, yeah. the words that we use around those. A, a lot of times, I think that they do say beta when, when this is in fact a demo. The game is so yeah. close to launch; it's going to be coming out soon. This might be a little bit of testing the servers and stressing them and making sure that they work. But for the game itself, this is the the fully finished product. This is the game as it's. So we're that's be that's what I went into it assuming. Like this late in the. In the cycle, like I'm sure the discs are already going off to print, and Ugh. you know, people who have their pre-orders <laughs> are making their decisions right about now whether to keep them or ditch them. I I mostly was left with kind of a little bit of concern from the beta. We saw three maps, um, and Rob's also seen Endor, and every single time we've seen this game, there's always been just something to every single map where you're like, eh, I'm not so sure about this. Like, Walker Assault on Hoth was so imbalanced towards the Imperials. And, and to be fair, it's a beta, and balance can be tweaked and fixed. But in this case, I don't know how it got through right. QA. 
to that point. Like, I wonder what the creative process was <clears throat> that allowed the Imperials to have their ATST walkers literally walk into the Rebel spawn, the spawn and kill everybody, or like a turret that fired directly into the Rebel base and killed everybody, mm -hmm. or an ATAT walker that fired into the Rebel base and killed everybody. Like, and you can't choose your spawn. It's something as simple as not even letting players choose where they're going to start to get to yeah. the objective. Right. Granted, yeah, you could you could spawn on a partner. But you know, you think of battlefield like uh, spawning or lobby menus. There's at least a freaking map. Like you know what I mean? Like I, I would actually. And that's what I'm just realizing now is you know there isn't a map to see what's what's going on in the battlefield field right now. Where are my guys? What tactical location can I come in and help out? It's just so up in the air. Like you know, we, we put footage up of like an ATST rampage I had as an Imperial, and I just flanked around on the side lane and just started owning people. I got like 15 kills because they're spawning in groups, like, you know, six guys at once, and I'm just annihilating them. And there's nothing they can do. They, they have no control over their spawning. So that was that was just like the walker saw on Hoth. Drop zone on Solist was just like a model of simplicity, and it was so simple and the pacing was so consistent that I, I tend to find those things get boring just because the map didn't have any terrain variety to it. It was all lava fields with little pools that burned your ankles and one landing pad with a ship you couldn't interact with. So like maybe that, that might be DICE's, so like in Battlefield what they would do is they would take a large map and section off a small area for team deathmatch style modes. So it's possible that map, to be fair, is much larger and has interesting sections. And that was just a boring section to pick for mm -hmm. the map. Um, and then survival on Tatooine, they only allowed normal mode. And in normal mode, the enemy AI like would fall asleep fighting you. Like I had an ATSD just kind of drift off in the middle of a gun battle and like <laughs> kind of lost focus on I'm bored. <laughs> yeah, like like so again, like ATSDs all all of the day. things that were curated for this demo, I just I just found problems with. But overall, yeah. I mean, this is something that is, at the end of the day, it's a marketing tool. It's trying yeah. to get you to, to try out the game. And enough people played it. You said over 9 million people. And they extended it long enough that it seems like, on that sense, it was a success. Mike, what, what do you think after having played it? Is this something that you feel like, I, I want to pre-order it? Or are you still kind of waiting for to see what the review is going to shake out to be? I don't know that I would pre-order. I didn't play it as extensively as uh, these two or a few people in the office, but I had fun with it. Uh, mm -hmm. I wasn't. I don't know that I went into it looking for like a balance as much as I would with a lot of shooters. But it was just great to be back in the Star Wars universe. But will that get me excited to pay for the season pass and pre-order mm -hmm. the game? I don't think so. I think I would Hell hesitate. No. <laughs> yeah. So you're not going to buy the season pass from this. I'm not. I'm, I'm probably going to handle it just like I did with Battlefield Four. Uh, I bought. I bought Battlefield Four. And then bought one expansion, and then you know I got I drifted away. I've been again. I'm not like a. I used to be an insane Battlefield guy, but so that's my own reason there. But buying hundred and twenty dollars worth for this game, and having this beta experience, you, there's no way. There's no way you would do it. But that, you, you yeah. mentioned dying. This is like the Battlefield experience, and then it's going to follow that same, uh, that that same setup, that same algorithm where mm -hmm. you have. Four packs. We don't know exactly what's going to be offered in them, but there's going to be some assortment, probably of of new maps and maybe some some new modes. Um, mm -hmm. Having seen that from the the battlefield model, why is that not something that you want to carry over into Star Wars? It traditionally, I mean, you can speak no, to this, but go for it. Yeah, I mean, traditionally, Battlefield three and four had at least one DLC that I didn't like. Mm -hmm. They were mostly had to do with taking a large battlefield and making it too close quarters. Um, they did that twice in a row on their first DLC, and so already, like, I had already paid for one of four DLCs that I didn't like ahead of time. So I've I've gotten to a point now where I'm I'll wait and just see how the DLC is before I'll buy it. And if there's even one DLC that you don't like, you've like saved yourself fifteen dollars or whatever mm -hmm. out of you know the, the pricing model. Right now, again, like this game though is very simple. I think it's very casual, and I think. Of those nine million people, like you pretty much know right away whether you like it or not because the design decisions are so specific. Not being able to choose your spawn, not having extensive loadouts, you know, like having the game choose when and where you go a lot of times. You you'll know whether you like that or not right away. And, and I think that that won't be a hard decision for casual players to make. Yeah, Rob. 
Oh, I just wanted to say we're, we're seeing a lot of aerial combat. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a video piece. The aerial combat is so confusing. It needed to be one to one. Like, so for instance, when you see a barrel roll, it's, it's just it's such a weird design choice. When you do a barrel roll, I'm sorry, not barrel roll, a flip, you're gonna be upside down. The game doesn't know, like, it then has to be like, okay, well, now I'm upside down. How the hell do I get back right side up? Your controls are the same for re left and right, and that yaw and roll are the same in one direction. So you're upside down. The, mm -hmm. the, the controls are just so weird and bizarre. Here you are. Uh, <laughs> automatically being swung into a hill when you're doing the snow speeder, I, I don't know. It's so just, was, that AT was that AT-AT was that pretty much invulnerable to those to the tow cable when it was next to that hill? It becomes vulnerable in the very very last portion of the fight, in which you can tow cable it, and oftentimes the timer would run out while you were in the QTE. So even though you would have cinched the walker, you would lose because the timer ran out. Mm -hmm. Like again, it's these. You have a demo, you have a curated <laughs> demo, and what you've shown is mostly concerning me. Um, and you know, when you ask the question about pre-orders, that means no, I'm not gonna pre-order it. Now, I'm open to the possibility that, there are good, that there's gonna be good modes and maps in this game. Um, there's a couple things that I'm looking forward to, like Supremacy is gonna be their conquest mode, and it's the sort of tug of war conquest mode. So that actually could be really cool. Um, cargo sounds a lot like Capture the Flag or Obliteration from Battlefield Hardline. Obliteration was a great mode in Battlefield 4. And Droid Run might solve the problems of Drop Zone by, it looks like, it, like the droids <laughs> move around, right? <laughs> so instead of just guarding static things, the, the droids are running mm -hmm. around. So like, already there's like, that's probably about half of the modes that I'm interested in. The other half of the modes, when I flip through the menus, I am definitely not interested in. Like, their team deathmatch, not interested in. Air supremacy, their fighter squadron mode, like, not interested in. So, sure. you know, like, there's half the content that I'm, like, tentatively looking forward to mm -hmm. seeing. Well, and Rob, as one of the biggest Star Wars fans in the office, like, oh. I, I think that there, there has <laughs> to be some, there has to be some maps or something that you're like, right. even, even though I'm on the fence now, like, as soon as they announce that, uh, no, I have to order that, as soon as I know that's in the game. Exactly, and that's, that's where I'm on the fence. I'm so looking forward to this movie. Mm -hmm. I watch the trailer about, like, five times every day. <laughs> but the movie, you know, as you can imagine, the seasons are going to um, correspond to the movie. You're going to mm -hmm. see, like, you know, in the trailer, the X-Wing's booking it on the water. Probably going to be in our superiority, uh, superiority map. You're going to have these correlations where you're like, oh, man, that would be really cool. What a, what a memorable moment from the movie that I'd love to play. That's where I'll probably get, I'll get sucked in. Mm -hmm. But I'm, i I got to play the game, the actual game first. <laughs> I'm not going to make that call. 120 mm -hmm. bucks is way too much. Is there anything that would pull you in, Mike? Yeah, I mean, like Aaron had said, I think I'm just more the person who would want to see how each individual pack plays mm -hmm. out. Uh, I would not mind spending $15 for, you know, another planet to play on or however they ch choose to separate it and whatnot. But, and I'm nowhere near as close as Rob but, or like a, a bunch of people in the office. I'm a huge Star Wars fan, but mm -hmm. I, I just can't, I don't know what they would need to do for me to just say, yes, I will pre-order it, I will pay $120 so I can prolong this experience for that long. Mm -hmm. Because right now it seems bare-boned from my impression. I've played a few hours, I haven't played a ton, and I don't see that being worth that money. But I'm hoping they can convince me. <laughs> well, last question for each of you guys. We've had some leaks come out of the game that we know there's going to be some additional characters, Han and, and Leia, the Emperor, as hero powers they're going to be able to get, mm -hmm. and possibly some new skins for, for those hero powers as well. Mm -hmm. What kind of additions like that would you like to see in the game? Like, whether it's even possible or not, or whether it's realistic, what, what's your kind of dream wish? If you throw Boba Fett in there. <laughs> oh, he's coming in. <laughs> yeah. He's I mean, in. He is. Yeah. He's, as a hero power. I'm pre ordering like, Waddle okay. As, as uh, you can control him in the Slave One, and as mm -hmm. well as uh, the well, real deal. Got, yeah, okay. there's words or widget. widget Wampa sorry. salt. Wicked. <laughs> Wampa <laughs> salt. <laughs> yeah, Wampa salt. That'd be it. Don't take your stuff as seriously. Just, dude. Just, how about just give me Wampas? How about that? Uh, what's that character name? The like, you seen the trailer? Like the like the. Um, uh, silver stormtrooper oh, cap he, captain like he looks, Phasma. I think yeah, he looked like a dark trooper the first time I saw yeah, him. He'd be that'd, awesome. That'd be Phasma that'd be might, tight. might be a lady trooper. Oh, yeah. she is. Yeah, cool. It's the girl yeah. from what's her name from um, Brienne of Tarth from yes. Game yeah. of Thrones. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, she totally kicks ass. Yeah. And those are a lot of cool things that we might see potentially. I think they take our ideas. I think they listen to us, and those are the things they're going to put into the game. Star Wars <laughs> Battlefront launches on November <laughs> November seventeenth. One month after that, you'll be able to see The Force Awakens in theaters on December 18th. Mm. 
And for even more GameSpot, or <laughs> for even more Star Wars stuff, stay tuned to GameSpot. All right, next up we have a cool trailer for you guys to check out. <laughs> <laughs> That's not necessarily related. Uh, Assassin's Creed Syndicate has some historical characters that they've added into the game, and we'll get to see those in this newest trailer. By 1868, London was the center of the largest empire the world had ever known. The city attracted the greatest thinkers from all parts of the world, each an ally who will help you fight against exploitation. Alexander Graham Bell, Scottish inventor and engineer. Inspired by the deafness of loved ones, he studied acoustics and was one of the early inventors of the telephone and other modern marvels. I've been working in something that's meant to stun an assailant. It's a blessing that you employ your genius for the common good, Alec. Karl Marx, the author of the Communist Manifesto, in his writing and in speeches, spent his life fighting for the rights of workers. I challenge you both to help those who really need your assistance, the working people. We accept. Shouldn't we at least talk about these things first? Sod it. We accept. Charles Darwin, father of the theory of evolution, his ideas defied popular thinking about the origin of species. I am used to people challenging my ideas. In fact, I live for it. Lately, however, attacks have taken a darker turn. Charles Dickens, in Oliver Twist and other tales, the novelist highlighted the plight of the poor, opening the eyes of the city's inhabitants to the deprivation around them. Here we are, in the world's most advanced city, yet its citizens leave themselves vulnerable to charlatans. Nearby. Bring her inside. Florence Nightingale. Her vision took nursing out of the home and turned it into a profession and set the standard for modern health care. Queen Victoria came to embody the century. She was known as the Grandmother of Europe. Your Majesty. And her 64-year reign saw the entire century dubbed the Victorian era. I call upon you to foil this traitorous plot. Now it's your turn to make history. Discover the secrets behind London's greatest men and women. The work begins immediately. Will you join us? Not every problem can be solved by blowing things sky high. What was the fun in that? Now at Amazon for access to the Darwin and Dickens conspiracy. Reserve now. Available October 23rd. Next up, we're going to be talking about the Halo 5 launch trailer that we saw recently. And we learned a lot of Halo news recently. I'm joined on the couch by Mike Mahardy and Rob Handlery. Now, you guys are some of the biggest Halo fans we have in the office, and, and I'm sure you guys have seen the trailer multiple times. What have we we saw a little bit of new stuff, a little bit of the old stuff. What was new in this trailer? We were talking about this morning, just like different enemy types that we weren't completely familiar with. We th were wondering what those guys in the white were, but I think we're gonna start talking about the Prometheans, right? Right, so it was like this Promethean character. Um, I found out his name is called the Warden, or he's a class of Promethean. Um, having played Warzone game mode a couple times, one a uh, few times at E3, those are some of the guys, the AI uh, elements of the mode, where you essentially, you know, you team up with, hey, so and so, let's go out here and basically stomp over this AI boss like figure to, you know, rake up points for your team. So, those Promethean guys, I was looking, I was watching the trailer as well, and they looked very Destiny like. Is, were those the characters you're talking about? The kind of Destiny like? Yes, <laughs> but in, in, in uh, Halo 343's defense, Prometheans started in Halo 4. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's more um, Destiny is, is stealing that, that original design. Yeah, so Bungie is just cherry-picking from everyone. I don't that's even right. think that's the correct use of the word, cherry-picking. But uh, yeah, they're just the, you know, the digitally reconstructed people. They kind of look like uh, elites as if they got uh, right. as the didact, you know, made them into Prometheans just through that process. I forget what it was called. But yeah, and then the entire trailer was set to uh, Muse's Knights of Cydonia. Oh, so good. Which is an really great. old song, and a lot of people were saying they don't want that song near Halo or a video game in general. But what? tell me you don't watch this trailer and just get amped as hell for this. <laughs> they were, when, especially when Otimo Cyrus is just jumping down the hill, shotgunning people in the face. And then it's like... <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. Dude, so it's great. It kicks in like right here, and then, oh man, it's, I'm, yeah. I'm amped. It was... 
It was good. Well, one thing we have not gotten a lot from this trailer, and we haven't learned a lot in general, but we're still getting these little hints, is where this story is going. We see mm -hmm. Master Chief when we get this, that there is some kind of conflict with Locke and there's the, the other Halo teams. And, and Mike, you are really into Halo lore. You've read a lot of these yeah. books. Like, you know the, Too the back and the front end. Guys, like, Rob, I think you were saying that you, you've played a lot of Halo games, but maybe not to the extent of yeah, I the mean, books. And I've played them all. Uh, and I and I felt like I knew the story pretty well, and this game was one of the first times where it spun me around a little bit, and it's like, wait, who's... Osiris' team, I get, I know um, uh, Buck was from ODST, correct? Yeah, yeah, like, certain characters I, I recognize, but, um, you know, who is this team that Master Chief has? Mm -hmm. And that pertains to the lore and the books. You know, I, I mean, I looked it up. I had to do my little wiki <laughs> research, obviously, but, like, you know, you find out that... Um, that this team is, you know, they're like, they're the original Spartan twos. The um, they grew up and trained with Master Chief, and uh, that's pretty cool. I mean, I hope I hope to play the game and they tap on a lot of that, you know, uh, backstory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you can go into more. I'm sure, Mike. Oh yeah, no, you you're right. There, these are pretty much the last few Spartan twos. You know, in the first in Halo Combat Evolved, the first game, you think that Master Chief is the last one, mm -hmm. and then you find out that if, when you you know after uh, Halo Reach, you find out a few of them survive, but uh, Halo The Fall of Reach, uh, Eric Nyland wrote it. It was just a prequel to um, the first Halo, and that's these are some of the original people. Even before they got the muscle augmentations so they could wear the suit, because if a normal human wears that suit, their reflex will be so fast they'll break a bone and then react to that, break another bone, just kind of kill yourself <laughs> really fast. It's gruesome in the book, but they need to get these muscle augmentations, and a lot of them die off from that, but um, I think it's Fred, Linda, and Kelly. They're each kind of specialists. Fred, or is it Sam? No, you had it right. Okay, so Fred is just the big, like, strong one, and, uh, you know, uh, Linda and Kelly kind of f fill out the fast and sniper roles. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's kind of this squad-based combat. Um, Anthony Luongo is a lead designer on Republic Commando, the Star Wars game, and now he's working on Halo 5, which kind of, from what I played in the campaign, it's kind of very much this, not a ton of tactics, but you can tell your teammates where to fire if you're not playing co-op, and you can tell them, you know, regroup on me, and you can kind of take these branching paths. And I think that's kind of cool that it's fitting into this narrative because it's, it seems like it's going to be a frantic narrative. You know, traditionally in Halos, you're on this alien world or just this ring world trying to figure things out. There's this mystery that's propelling you forward, even in Halo 4 when you're on Requiem. Mm -hmm. But now this just seems like it's straightforward, just Team Osiris fucking chasing after the Chief, and the Chief, you have no idea, like, whether he's good or bad anymore because I, I won't spoil the ending of Halo 4. I don't know how many people have finished it, mm -hmm. but... Something happens at the end of Halo 4 that's gonna mess with his mm -hmm. head. So now he's kind of, from what I played, you're kind of, you're messed up, and then you can see that, and mm -hmm. you can see the 343 is trying to push that. So I'm interested to see the dynamic between Blue Team and Osiris as they're chasing Chief. Well, if they need different teams, and it sounds like they're trying to solve a mystery, they probably should call in well, maybe Fred Velm and Shaggy. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. And then the Ghostbusters oh come in and start wrecking people too. <laughs> What yes, is this? Justin. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, you know there there was one trailer where I saw it was it was uh, the blue team in like a pelican going somewhere, and Chief's just like flying, and like the other three other in the back, they're like, "Dude, Chief's kind of losing his mind." Right yeah, now. should we talk to him? I'm like, what, what's going on with this guy? And he's you know he's just gung ho. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's what's funny because these are the people that he grew up with. The Spartan Two program was really messed up. Uh, Catherine Halsey, his character, would come in abduct these kids who were showing signs of promise, clone them, give the clones to the parents. She literally took right. John from a playground. Yeah. I'm not kidding. She went to a playground, took him, put his clone on the playground. That clone went back to the parents. They have no idea that the actual John's been missing. Hello, father. He went through like Spartan. <laughs> That's me, John. Are you okay today? Yeah. You, s you seem a little off. <laughs> Did <laughs> Ashley said no to that. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so, great. So anyway. Um, so it's, these are the people that he's closest with in his whole life, aside from, you know, Cortana. And it's interesting to see them, they come up and, like, put their hand on his back, like, dude, are you all right? Are you, are right. you sure? And then he's like, fuck you, we're going, and everybody's yeah. just, mm -hmm. the entire human race is kind of like, this guy is losing his mind, and we should probably do something to stop him. You know, and we'll learn a lot more about the story as it goes along, of course, but we did learn some more about how the game itself will, will shake out. Now, there's not going to be any big team battle, but they're taking that out of the multiplayer playlist for, for a reason. Right. I think the idea is that when uh, multiplayer kicks off, they, they want people to really dive into the new ones, right? Warzone and Arena. Um, you know, all of the DLC for Halo 5 will be free, so it's like, you know, you don't have to stress about that. Um, 
I, I think I, if I recall, big team battles and more of the, you know, maybe oddball are the ones <clears throat> that I didn't see on the list will come out down the road toward the mm-hmm. end of the year. Um, so they're coming, you know, and, and personally, Warzone was so much fun. I, I, I'm, just, I'm really excited for that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it could be the one to fill the gap left by big team battle. Right. But the thing that I think maybe people are more concerned about, and which Bungie, the, or, well, yeah, Bungie the developer has had to comment on. 343, three, not Bungie, the people <laughs> on the left. Those are The ones who different. stole <laughs> the Prometheans. 343 <laughs> three has commented on microtransactions, and I think mm-hmm. that can always be kind of a sword. That can be a very big sticking point. And in this, there is going to be a microtransaction element where if you want to get these requisition packs, the Rex, mm-hmm. you can either use in-game currency or you can spend real-world money. But mm-hmm. How do you guys feel about that? I, I feel all right with what... I mean, and this was the... The looming question was, what's the conversion? Mm-hmm. How much... Will it cost to get Rex? And so we looked it up just before, and you know, it's uh, well, they released this a couple weeks ago, I think. Uh, again, the price range was uh, two thousand Rex points for it was a, how much? Uh, Four dollars, three dollars, mm-hmm. which basically correlates to two games, two thirty-minute matches of Warzone. That's that's nothing to me. I mean, that's I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems like you're getting a fair amount of rewards from just playing. Yeah, and it doesn't. I just inherently don't love microtransactions in a game that's already $60, but sure. I think this doesn't seem awful. Um, mm. It seems like you're getting rewarded for the amount of time you play, and it doesn't seem like the money will speed, like, push you past people in too big of a way. I think mm-hmm. it still will have a balance between you're pl- going to play a lot of our game, we're going to reward you for it. If you want to pay, go for it. Go for I, it. If you want it, I think, I think of it as, you know, you have these three different types of rec cards. You have your cosmetics... Assassinations, those are permanent, just as unlocking certain weapons. Vehicles are kind of the burn cards. You know, use a Mantis uh, late game. But it comes down to you can only, if you were really going to get one of these items, you know, like a Mantis, and you're going to pay the $3 or whatever it is to get a couple of these guys, you still have to do, you have to play well in order to unlock it on the battlefield. So it's, there's still a, there's still a, uh, a ro- like a roadblock that's basically stopping people from just you know um, you know buying a tons amount of cards and using them whenever they want. You can't. You have to be able to perform well in the um, in the war zone field in mm-hmm. order to pull them out. So I'm okay with that. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it's kind of a pay to win situation. I mean, maybe we'll find out it is when we play the game more. But like you said, I really don't think that's the case at all. From what like the info they've given us, it doesn't mm-hmm. seem like that's the case. Right, and I do wonder also, um, you know, for the arena mode. Um, your pay to like your burn cards aren't there, so the pay to win aspect is completely in, uh, removed. I wonder if that's even going to be like an option for like custom modes. Maybe you can like turn off any kind of like aspects correlating to that. You know what I mean? For like SWAT, maybe you can sure. just get like down, down and gritty and just like have, you know, just the basic um, power weapons on a map, and that's it. Yeah. So we'll see. I don't know. Well, so my last question, talking about the story and, you know, since we have someone who is so knowledgeable of, of all the, the intricacies of Halo, they've made a big deal of being either Team Master Chief, Team Locke. Where do you think the story is going? What is your wild fan theory for how this is actually going to play out? Since uh, right now we don't have the game, we don't know what's going to happen. What, what do you think is going to be? Ooh. Personally, I would love to see Chief just lose his mind and just be batshit crazy by the end, and then Locke has to come in, and then Chief still kills him, and then, you know, Halo 6, Chief is just a lunatic. So, right, it's a it's a trilogy part. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I did hear that, like, this the rumor, or, like, not rumor, the, the facts are that a lot of questions are going to be laid out than more answered. So, yeah, there's going to be, there's going to be probably some crazy cliffhanger at the end of this, just like there was a Halo 2. Yeah. It's just, like... Oh god! Now I gotta <laughs> yeah. wait. I gotta wait three, two, two more years for the next one. Like, ugh. yeah, two finish with uh, him, oh, on, yeah. him on the the forerunner, the right. forerunner ship. The says, uh, Chief, what yeah. are you doing on that? He's like finishing this fight, <laughs> yeah. and then it just cuts to the music. I could see. Obviously, it's the Reclaimer trilogy, and Chief is the Reclaimer as for all intents and purposes, as far as we're led to believe. So. I and I think they're pushing narrative ever since Halo Four. I actually loved Halo 4's story, and I think that it definitely will just leave three open and maybe take that traditional trilogy arc of the second one being the really dark one and not right. necessarily you know leaving the resolution open for the third game. The Empire Strikes Back, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, two well, towers. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
Empire Strikes Back. I, I will. I said that. I'm interested to see where this is going, <laughs> how this is going to pan out. Mike, uh, Rob, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, for all of you guys at home, Halo Five launches on October 27th. That's coming up really soon. What do you think the story is going to be? How do you think this is all going to pan out? Let us know. And thanks for watching. So next up, we got another trailer. We're going to see. Oh. Oh, Rocket League. So there's some Rocket League. I know some big fans of The Office here. Rocket I've been playing League. it. Did you, have you been playing the new Back to the Future DLC? No, that's next That's week. the trailer that we're going to watch. Uh, my you know, that, 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 that DLC that's out there, that's old news. What we're going to see now is some Back to the Future DeLorean action. I feel like an idiot. We've got to go back, Marty. <laughs> well, we're not back. We, we're back with the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> Smooth, good that segue. Was, that was a really good segue. I'm good at these. The segues, I, I've had a lot of practice. <laughs> Always You're doing great, Justin. Mm -hmm. So I'm joined on the couch for a new segment. We're going to be talking with some Scott Butterworth, Matt Espinelli. These Hello. are two of our big Deus Ex fans in the office. And Scott, you recently got the chance to try out Deus Ex Mankind Divided. This was our first time getting hands on. Yeah. It, you had a big preview, but overall, what was your, uh, what was your experience with it? Uh, I guess my experience was basically, if you've played Human Revolution, you, you pretty much know what to expect out of Mankind Divided. Uh, it very much feels like they are expanding on and iterating on the ideas established in Human Revolution and just more refining them than reinventing them. Uh, the mechanics are going to feel very familiar to people who played that game and, of course, anybody who's played any of the Deus Ex games, really. Mm -hmm. um, but there was, there was new stuff to try out. Um, there you were had things a lot that, of time to try. You were in this one yeah. level for, for three hours. Yeah. Well, so yeah, if anybody read the feature that went on uh, that went up on the site last Thursday, um, that was a completely true headline. Uh, the way that a lot of these preview events work, I mean, they were nice enough to bring us up to Idas Montreal to play in the studio, and generally in those types of situations, they have a very specific portion of the game that they are allowing us to play. This is the part that's not buggy, that's not going to crash, that they've sort of like polished a little bit so you can play it before the game is actually done. Um, so generally those sections are relatively sure. They're just to give you a taste and an idea of what the game's going to be like. And so typically because those sections are short, the amount of time you get to play them is, you know, also short because they expect you to get through it relatively quickly. That was not the case in Montreal. Uh, interestingly, they kind of just let me loose on this level and we're like, yeah, like you've got like three or four hours. You can just kind of play around, do whatever you want. Uh, so I just kept playing through it over and over and tried different things every time. Um, obviously one of the big hooks for people who may not be familiar with the games, you can kind of approach them in a, in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, the two major obvious ways to do it are you know, straight combat or straight stealth. Mm -hmm. um, it is completely possible to play through any Deus Ex game without killing anybody, um, with the exception of boss battles, which we will get to. Um, but it's also possible to play through like it's a traditional first-person shooter and just shoot and kill everyone and blow things up and just kind of run for it. But it's not quite like a like a Hitman style stealth, different paths to choose kind of game. Correct. Yeah. Um, so that was what was interesting about getting so much time to play the game. Uh, I really was able to explore all of the different options and all of the the different potential approaches that you could take. Um, you know, one of the things I talk about in the future that I think is really unique to the Deus Ex series is uh, just how detailed and dense the level design is. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's designed in a way to support all of these different potential play styles. Um, the sort of tortured metaphor that I, that I use to explain this, not in the text, but when I was speaking with the developers, was it's, each level is kind of like a piece of rope. And stick with me, because this is a little tortured and I realize it's horrible. But <laughs> So a piece of rope has a beginning and an end, right? Like there's a start, there's an end. It can rope in any number of directions, right? But a rope really is a variety of threads 
all spun together, wound together uh, to create this cohesive single unit, mm -hmm. right? So the level design in Deus Ex is very much the same thing. There's, you know, you start at one part of the level, you need to get to another part of the level, but the number of paths you can take in between and the number of different approaches are incredibly extensive to the point that even after three hours, I was talking to other people who had played the same portion and learning things that I didn't discover in that amount of time, which is pretty crazy because it was not, I was playing it for three hours and still didn't see everything is like kind of uh, just incredible. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, yeah, that was my hands-on experience with the game. Long mission. Mm -hmm. um, so the fact that I was playing it for three hours and still didn't see everything is like kind of uh, just incredible. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, yeah, that was my hands-on experience with the game. So Matt, uh, you didn't get to play Mankind Divided, but you have played a lot of the series as a whole. Going into it, are, do you have any concerns that you, you're really hoping that they, they address with the sequel? Well, for one thing, um, the, one of my major concerns would have to be the uh, enemy AI, uh, mm -hmm. that was a hugely kind of criticized factor of human revolution. So I was actually kind of curious for Scott. Yeah. Uh, from your experiences, how was that? <laughs> yeah, you know, we were actually talking about this uh, a little earlier today in the office. Um, and I, I would say that it's probably a little too early to make, you know, a, a full ruling on exactly how good the AI is. I mean, that's, right. that's, a, that's something that generally gets tweaked right up until launch. Um, it's something that can be improved or changed uh, with relative ease. Um, and that said, I, I had both good and bad experiences with the AI. Like, for example, um, there was one mission I was playing through uh, in just entirely stealth and had the tranquilizer sniper rifle and was hiding an event and shot a guard and somebody sort of behind him noticed that he collapsed and crumpled to the ground and so he came walking over to investigate and as he you know stopped and stood over the you know lifeless body of his friend <laughs> i sniped him and then he fell asleep and fell down and somebody else noticed that this happened and he wandered over and eventually there were like three or four guys in a dog pile of just like all asleep life um but yeah, I think there's an interesting point to be made there that maybe that's not so much a product of poor AI as much as it's just like how stealth mechanics and games mm -hmm. frequently work it's each other. Time-honored stealth games. Which is like not how that would go in real life. Um, but yeah, I think there's an interesting point to be made there that maybe that's not so much a product of poor AI as much as it's just like how stealth mechanics and games mm -hmm. frequently work. I mean, you could do the exact same thing in most Metal Gear games or Splinter Cell games. I mean, that's just kind of a byproduct of stealth in games, the way it works mm -hmm. mechanically, but that sort of stuck out to me as an interesting uh, experience with the AI. But then on the flip side of that coin, I think the AI also demonstrated some uh, really, there were some really intelligent moments. Mm -hmm. um, when I went in Guns Blazing, they would frequently either you know flank to get a better position on me, which is pretty standard, but also I thought was interesting, they would retreat if I was doing mm -hmm. well. Like they would actually move further back in the level and find cover and get away from me if I had already killed other members of you know uh, other teammates of theirs. Uh, so I thought that that was actually pretty impressive that mm -hmm. they reacted that well instead of just rushing at me and letting me shoot them one by one. Um, and, I, and I will say that don't go in guns blazing in this game. Uh, you will die. Uh, you will run out of ammo and you will die. It's very much meant to be a cover-based game. And, and I think that really stems from the fact that it is a very cerebral and strategic experience. Mm -hmm. It's not meant to be, you know, a just Duke Nukem style blow everything up experience. Um, you really need to assess the battlefield, use the environment to your, to your advantage, um, mm -hmm. very tactically move among the various uh, obstacles that you can use for cover. Um, so that was, yeah. Again, the, the AI, I think, was, uh, was pretty impressive, but I, I don't recommend running at them. Matt, when you were playing these games, how did you typically uh, approach the problems you would come up against? Um, usually by stealth. Uh, though I'd love to kind of make use of a hybrid between the two every once in a while, just to kind of mm -hmm. play the cat and mouse game. Um, that was always my preference. Did you, actually, Scott, did you ever <laughs> kind of utilize, because I know you did like a combat sort of approach and a stealth yeah. approach. Did you ever use a mix between them at all? Interestingly, so, I mean, the way that it would typically work in the game is you can, choose your upgrades as you're playing, right? I mean, there's an extensive progression system. It is an RPG at its core. Um, but because we were playing a game, or a mission from the middle of the game, they just created some preset loadouts for us. And there was a, a stealth loadout, a combat loadout, but then also a, a balanced loadout that kind of mm. gave you a little bit of both. Right. Um, so yeah, if you, if you want to play that way, you absolutely can. Actually, one, one way that I, uh, you know, one method I used, um, basically relied on exploration more than anything. Uh, 
and, and I think that that would actually serve as a nice balance between stealth and combat because you can kind of utilize either one depending on what you come up against as you explore the level. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually managed to make it pretty much to the end of the mission without encountering anybody simply by skirting the edge of the level and <laughs> finding a wall that I could bust through to get into the back of this theater I was trying to infiltrate. Um, so again, it, the game does uh, a pretty impressive job of allowing for any play style that you can come up with, uh, including sort of a balance between stealth and combat. Right. Well, coming up on the end of the stage, did you get to go into a boss battle? Did you see how those mechanics were Did not, work? although I was able to talk about that with the uh, developers. Like I said, so the segment that I played was relatively short. It was clearly intended to you know, allow me to get my hands on the, the mechanics of the game, just the core gameplay. Uh, it was not indicative of the overall experience. I mean, I, I saw very little of the story, very little of the social aspect of the game, and also didn't play any boss battles. But I, I'm well aware <laughs> that that is the m biggest single issue that people had with Human Revolution. So I talked about that extensively with the developers, as well as uh, the endings if, for people who didn't play the previous game. Most people were not happy with the way that they handled sort of the... the choices at the end of the game mm -hmm. in a sort of Mass Effect 3 kind of way. I'll try not to spoil anything. <laughs> um, but suffice to say that the developers were well aware of everyone's concern, and in fact they themselves even knew at the time. They weren't completely satisfied with the way that those those aspects of the game turned out, but even just from building them, they they learned. Uh, even before they got any reaction from, from the audience, they knew what didn't work about it and what they needed to change, and, and hopefully we will see those improvements uh, come alive in, in Mankind Divided. And we're also going to get to hear more about these things. I mean, you had a very extensive preview up on the site, but there's some more stuff that we're going to be coming, that's going to be coming out of that. Yeah, so the preview that I put up last week was purely uh, a hands-on focused, you know, just talking about my experience playing the game. I'm also working on a feature that's going to be very uh, interview driven. It's going to be a lot of my discussion with the developers. I was able to sit down with five different members of the core creative team, discuss basically every aspect of the game's design. Um, so it gets a little heady, but there's a lot of really interesting information about there. Stuff about you know Adam Jensen's progression, the way this ties into the overarching uh, mythos of Deus Ex. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of sort of deeper material that I think people will be very interested to read. And Matt, I guess our, our last question, is, is there anything that you want to know from, from Scott or that you really hope that they, they change or that they fix about the game to just make this an overall better experience? Well, it was more <laughs> not so much a serious thing, though. I kind of wonder myself <laughs> if there's going to be a new sort of replacement for the classic, but also kind of cringeworthy, I never asked for this. Man, that seriously, <laughs> like that, that line is the, the cake is a lie of Deus Ex. <laughs> just the most... So I, I don't know. Who knows? I mean, yeah. like I said, unfortunately, I got very little exposure to the story mm -hmm. or to the dialogue. Um, didn't get to meet uh, Elias Effects as the uh, the voice actor. Um, <laughs> maybe someday. I, I believe that there's a GameSpot interview with him somewhere mm -hmm. from back in the day, but I didn't get to talk to him, unfortunately. Um, so it's entirely possible there will be some new meme that emerges from this <laughs> game, but uh, as of yet, we have not seen it. So someday. Well, one of the first places you'll be able to find that out is probably going to be here on GameSpot, and we'll be looking to you, Scott, Matt, thanks so much for talking about the game, and I look forward to hearing more what you guys think about it as, as it comes along. So, Deus Ex Mankind Divided is due out February 23rd, 2016, so we have a few more previews left before we see the final game. But, thanks so much for watching. And the next thing that we're going to be talking about is what our giveaway is. I guess we're, this is out of show, this is the, the end of the show, but we are doing a really cool giveaway. Oh of a backpack. <laughs> Good catch. What's Dang. inside this amazing backpack? So we're doing a Tomb what Raider backpack? themed giveaway. Uh, There's a backpack? You see the, uh, oh yeah, it's good. Can, can you see it? Can you guys? Is it, is it camo because it's invisible? <laughs> camo index is if 99. You would like Bad to, joke, don't sweat it. <laughs> to win this Tomb Raider themed backpack, you can follow GameSpot and retweet for a chance to win. Did we put anything inside? Is there? Is there? No. I think yes, there's, there's stuff. Oh and I think well, there will be more stuff. I believe we're in the process of gathering random items from the office. There's Astro Survival the backpack Guide, with. a Witcher comic. Think about all these wonderful things you can win inside the Tomb Raider themed backpack. Witcher. <laughs> we'll be Just filling it with even more card. stuff. Woo. But ultimately, it's full of your hopes and dreams for what Tomb Raider is going to be. So follow GameSpot on Twitter and retweet for a chance to win this cool Tomb Raider themed backpack. You may not be able to see it. It's, again, it's camo, so it's, yeah, so it's invisible. Yeah. I'm going to throw this I cannot. over there. I didn't even notice that happened. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, so that's the, the end of the show. Again, Scott, Matt, thanks so much for coming out. And hopefully next week you'll get to have Danny O'Dwyer back here. You'll get to learn what amazing things he was working on. And I will go back to my other job as a part-time Robin Williams impersonator. <laughs> thanks so much for watching, guys. Bye.